My Garden Railway Life Steam Loco Building started in 2005 with the building of two locos to Dave Watkins's Idris de Winton plans. One loco luckily lagged behind, and so some modifications were made to it. The main were to raise the cylinders up to a more prototypical height, and to solder the port block direct to the border shell, to keep the cylinders hot. These worked out so well, making the loco powerful and water efficient. Inevitably, I desired a larger loco, but I was mad on De Winton's, so I decided to do a scaled up version of the second smaller loco. This time, I also used the scale dimensions of the prototype loco, George Henry. The wheels are a little larger. My line is 45mm gauge. Many opt for 7 8 scale to represent 2 foot gauge. But the track is no longer 1 and 3 quarter inches, and the Penryn Quarry Railway is not 2 foot, but 1 foot 10 and 3 quarters. The just about perfect scale for PQR on 45mm gauge track is 24mm scale, or 2mm to the inch. I built Jack to 24mm scale. Now I build to 1 inch or 1 twelfth scale for simplicity and availability of Doll's House scale items. The naming convention for my loco builds are based on what was happening at the time. In this case I was listening to the White Stripes albums late at night in the workshop. So this loco is named after Jack White. This is the start of Jack's construction images. We had just bought a digital camera. Three finished turn steel wheels oiled up. The treads are 40mm diameter. The flanges I think are 2.5mm deep to suit the LGB track. I made the flanges too shallow on the smaller locos, 1.5mm. Should be 2mm for gauge 1. Here I am, finished turning the 3 degree taper on the fourth wheel using a between centers mandrel on my bench drill powered Unimat 3 lathe. Jack was solely built using this lathe setup. Moving right on to the boiler barrel. This was made from 1.5mm copper sheet, wrapped round a 70.6mm diameter steel former. Here it is wired up, ready for brazing. Here's the brazed boiler shell with built up copper mounting pads. The safety valve manifold mounting pad is being fly cut in the lathe. The completed boiler with all its bronze bushes and the chimney brazed in. The central flue is 3 quarter inch ID copper water pipe. Inside the firebox, a mass of porcupine spikes to aid heat transfer to the water. The six pot meths burner to fire the large boiler. The completed burner assembly sitting on the incomplete frames. These frames are made from two pieces of 40 by 40 by 2.5 mil angle iron, braced together down the middle. The same iron used to make my brazing hearth. I remember brazing them right outside the workshop with a large Sievert 2942 burner. Axles attached to the frames with the burner just resting on the rails. The frames have been sprayed a grey primer. Close up of the soldered brass axle box assembly detail. The ends are finished. I used 1 8 inch steel plate, which was a little rusty, so they were bead blasted clean. They were far too heavy for bending, so I soldered pieces of steel tube on the lower edge for the distinctive snowplow curves. The built up front axle with the cranks loctited and pinned. I increased the stroke to the maximum possible amount, to an overscale 28mm. This is the longest stroke of any of my engines. I firmly believed that the longer the stroke the better. It certainly worked out well. The axle continued throughout the assembly until after the cranks were glued and pinned, then the excess pieces were hacksawed out and filed to blend. Machining the cylinder port face in the Unimat 3. It's been soldered to an angle plate. It needed a lot of counterbalancing. Using a boring bar to machine the curved surface for the cylinder. Rather than make my own cylinders, I bought in commercial LG2 gunmetal plane bearings. 
These make great cylinders as they are accurately bored and available in many bores, ODs and lengths. The cylinder bottom cover with built-in o-ring. The cylinder is 9 16 bore with an OD of 3 quarter inches with 3 16 piston rod. There is a recess for a thin plate to retain the o-ring. This will be fitted by two countersunk 10BA screws later. The two cylinder assemblies and the central port block. The block is gun metal and the port faces are brass. The port faces have been soldered onto the cylinders. Progress so far. The boiler mounting flange has been soldered to the boiler and a large hole has been chain drilled and filed in the frames to admit the boiler. The cylinder port block has been soldered to the boiler and it is also supported by two pillars and a fancy bracket. Two slots have been cut out for the piston rods to travel through. These have been drilled and filed to size. Facing the upper and lower parts are the two parts split big ends, super glued to the faceplate. These are brass. One of my best achievements to date is the reversing valve. I had seen them on other models, but not the internals, and I had to figure out how it all should work, and it did. I'm not sure I could do this now. Luckily I kept the sketches. For aesthetic reasons I didn't want a rotary valve on top of the cylinders. I wanted the reversing arm to go to the approximately correct position. Here's the valve in place. It split down the middle so that I could deburr the cross drillings as the valve bobbin has silicon o-rings at either end and we don't want them damaged by burrs. The body is gunmetal. The central exhaust is pointing downwards. You can see the two steam inlet holes at each end of the port block. The steam holes that feed the cylinders are blanked off at the top after drilling. Brackets have been brazed to the pillars and valve control arms and shaft fitted. Here's the reverser sketch. You needed careful working out to get the throw just right. Reverser stand in place on the newly cut out footplate. This is made from 1.2mm brass sheet. An insulating gasket has been made from card to keep the direct boiler heat from the frames. Each holding down screw has an insulation washer also. I'm not sure what this bolt is for, but it looks like I've shortened a bolt and extended its thread by soldering it to a mandrel. It shows the holding power of soft solder. I forged the reverser rod, heating and hammering the ends on round steel rod to make good pivot eyes. This is the safety valve manifold with pressure gauge tube incorporated. This bolts up to the copper pad on the side of the boiler. The angle tube takes steam from the top of the boiler at the central flue. Fitted to the boiler with one safety valve mounted. The steam inlet manifold for the port block. I also filed the steam hole square. This has given the loco a good exhaust sound. The regulator components with a safe, unable to be fully unscrewed type of construction. The tube at the rear takes steam from the top of the boiler at the flue. Pressure gauge and regulator handle fitted. Originally a 0-80 PSI gauge was used. Water gauge glass being fitted. I used a big 6mm tube so that bubbles wouldn't be a problem and a blowdown valve not needed. I provided bushes on both sides of the boiler as I didn't know which side I would use. The burner has been fitted. It has two pins for pulling out and dropping the fire quickly. Tapered copper firebox fitted. This was formed over the turned down and tapered boiler former to fit between the wheels. The quick burner dropping pin. There's one each side with a brass head and steel pin. The dead leg lubricator based on that of Duinton number no. 2 with shut off valve. Amongst the cornflowers. The lubricator has been fitted and a start made on the steam manifold. The blower valve has now been fitted. The cosmetic built-up brass frame curves have been bolted on.
Bunker and tank fabricated from 1.2mm brass sheet. Blower finished. The pipe goes down the funnel, as I didn't want to cut any more holes in the frame at this time. Dummy brake handle fitted. Cranks and coupling rods made and fitted. I've got borrowed safety valves from Dwinton's 1 and 2 fitted at this stage. Dumb buffer made from Quiller decking timber and fitted the front and rear. One of two safety valves being made, o-ring groove for the finger tight sealing. The components of the safety valve except the o-ring. It's my copy of the roundhouse design based on the image that I saw. Safety valve set to 40 psi. The whistle valve fitted to the steam manifold. The boiler has a drain cock. I like to fully drain my boilers after a run. This valve is of the safety spindle cannot be fully unscrewed type. The whistle valve developed a fault. It turned out that the stainless balls that a local supplier sent me weren't stainless at all. Baking the new black paint on the boiler using my Sievert 3757 stand. The loco is mostly finished here. From the dates on the photos, it has taken one year and two months to get to this stage. I'm a lot slower now. A month later, the blower pipe failed due to the extreme heat in the flue. It was repaired by thickening it with a 3.30 seconds copper tube in the risky area. It hasn't failed again. Fingers crossed. This is how the whistle pipe is routed. I conquered my dislike of boring holes in the footplate. The two safety valves. I restricted the outlet on the first so that the second would lift on occasion. The steel chimney adapter for the steam raising fan. I carefully remove it when there's enough steam for the blower. Real coal in the bunker. I handmade the three link chains from 2 mil steel. In 2010 I made a new whistle. It has turned out to be my best whistle. Here I am planing at the slot with a lathe tool on its side. The finished slot for the whistle block. The finished whistle carefully soldered so as to not fill the steam passages with solder. This is what plagued the first whistle. This is a footplate steam fitting for the whistle. I proudly machined it all in one go on the Myford. The underside of Jack showing the whistle in place. The longer the whistle the better. Also showing the blower and exhaust pipes. A new iteration of the whistle valve showing a shuttle with an o-ring for sealing. Eventually I found that the loco would reach a boiler pressure of 30 psi when running slowly, so I fitted a 0 to 60 psi gauge as I like to see the needle vertical. Thanks for watching.